the next one is called Children. He may look back, he may attack the holy rosary intact. Everybody, happy Friday. Ashley from Recording King here. I am so excited. To, well, I'm excited every Friday, but if my level of excitement could go even a little higher than normal today, I am so excited to have here as our guest, my friend. He plays drums. He plays guitar. He plays, I just found out today, xylophone. Eric Slick. Eric, thanks so much for joining us, man. How are you? Oh, I'm great. Thank you for having me. This is a delight. Xylophone. I did not know that until today. Marimba, marimba oh, xylophone, whatever you want to call it. Uh, yeah, I started playing marimba when I was about 15 years old. So I have to say, Children is one of my favorite songs of yours. So Thank you. Can, that's the one that we just heard, of course. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's about and kind of how you came to the inspiration for that particular one? Sure. So there was a day two years ago when I was writing songs at my house and I was reading this book called Healing the Child Within. I have very self-helpy, but yeah, it's sort of about like addressing your younger self and uh, giving your younger self a hug, uh, literally and figuratively. <laughs> so this song is a younger self hug. It's a younger self hug. So it's like, and, you know, it may, maybe if you were bullied as a kid, which I certainly was like, it's sort of a way of acknowledging that and forgiving all that, all that, you know. Was it therapeutic for you to write it because of that? Would you say? Absolutely. Yeah. It, I think that all writing is a form of therapy, whether we want to admit it or not. You know, we're always kind of using it to sort through things that we want to address in our waking life. And that's the beauty of writing songs is that it's like we're addressing the subconscious. 
do you feel like once it's out in the world, you are comfortable giving up control over that type of? I find it to be extremely therapeutic to do that. It's not like, I wouldn't say it's like cathartic or anything, but at the very least, it's like, you know what? It's cool that I was able to turn that feeling into a piece of music. And then you can subsequently put it behind you emotionally and then move on from it. Definitely. I think if, if you uh, try to approach it with some kind of emotional maturity, like you can definitely let go of it. Emotional maturity is, is sometimes a humorous oxymoron in my own life, as in many's, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, being a musician, it's like, a, oh, there's some famous joke where it's like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And uh, the kid says, musician. And uh, the parent says, oh, you, you can't do both. You can't grow up and be a musician. <laughs> so. That is totally true. That's totally true. Yeah, yeah. So usually That's... my first questions are along the lines of, what's your first memory of the guitar? How did you first interact with the guitar? But I just want to cut through that right now. I know that you grew up in a musical family. I did. Was drums your first instrument? Tell me about growing up in a musical family and like how that impacted you. Absolutely. So... If we want to go all the way back, my grandpa was a jazz trombonist and he played in like the Buddy Rich big band. He played with like any any jazz luminary you could think of, my grandpa played with him. And uh, my mom's sister played harp and my mom played guitar too. And then on uh, my dad's side, my dad was an avid uh, guitar collector, player and uh, like Beatles fanatic. So I had a lot of music happening all around the house all the time. Um, but weirdly my first instrument was actually violin because the the school didn't think that i was old enough to play drum kit yet so they're like well we'll, we'll give him a violin we'll, we'll take some lessons at like the local presbyterian church i had this teacher and you know like i remember playing the violin and even at like my young age i was probably like three years old i was like super miserable and all the while i wanted to play drums so my parents got me a set of bongos which i proceeded to destroy and then they got me a Yamaha electronic uh, pad kit, like the Yamaha DD50. I like ripped out the soldering of that kit. And then when I was five, my parents were like, okay, he's finally old enough. We can get him a drum kit. And then uh, subsequently I started taking lessons, uh, like snare drum lessons with a guy named Carl Matola. And so your sister, Julie, is also a musician. Who is older between the two of you? She's older, but she came to music a little bit later. Uh, I think when we were younger, she was trying to figure out like, what she was going to do and so she was doing ballet and then she was doing softball and then around the time we were 11 and 12 we started playing drum we kind of landed on being a rhythm section together um so yeah she's she's amazing bass player uh she's like totally become her own thing and a virtuosic in her own way but she was a little bit later i think when i was really young i approached music with a certain kind of like ferocity and uh, i was just obsessed about stuff I, I grew up a drummer myself, and I also played in many, many bands with my drummer, Travis, who, my brother, Travis, who mm. was the recording king as well. So I know what it's like to grow up with a kind of a family musical dialogue, which is super awesome. It takes something for your parents to be able to allow you to practice drum kit when you are growing up. And I'm always fascinated by people whose, whose parents have let them kind of roll as a drummer. Tell me about that when you were a kid. My parents were so cool about it and they were so encouraging. Like I, I couldn't have been in a better position because we were in a small Philadelphia row home where like our neighbors would hear me drum at any hour of the day. So luckily, you know, I never got the cops called on me personally, uh, but my parents were super cool with it and they were really encouraging. They were like, you know, we'll put the drum kit in the living room. So it's not like I had a lot of place. To, yeah, I didn't have like a place to put it. There's no basement. There's no like, I couldn't put the drum kit in my bedroom. Uh, so I just had like a full on sonar kit in my living room. And then to speak to what you said about playing with your brother, like uh, something I want to hammer home is that like, there is absolutely nothing like playing with a sibling. It's, it's like having a secret ingredient that no musician can have access to. Um, you know, fam any kind of family music stuff is magical. Do you find when you're able to jam with Julie from time to time, you guys like lock into your previous connection? Oh yeah, I mean, it's telepathy, you know, and when we were at our like peak, when we, we used to play with a guy named Adrian Ballou from King Crimson and That's like when we were, who's we, 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 some guy, uh, but, when, but when we uh, toured with him, 
something that would come back to us a lot from the crowd was like, man, it's like you guys are reading each other's minds. And I wouldn't necessarily say that it's exactly telepathy, but it's more just like we know each other really well. And we also know what our inclinations are on our instrument. So it's like if Julie's going to play a triplet pattern, I can predict when she's going to do that. Finishing each other's sentences, more or less. So drums, of course, though, is not known for being a super melodic instrument. When did you decide that you were going to leave Terry Bozio behind and go towards songwriting? <laughs> well, you know, it, songwriting was a lot later for me, um, partially because, like, I spent so much energy drumming, and I thought that I was going to be, like, like a Terry Bozio type. Like, I was going to be doing clinics at Sam Ash or something with a 180-piece drum set, like... That was what I initially thought, but my introduction to guitar, like I said, my dad had a guitar collection, and one time I was sick in sixth grade, and uh, I picked up my dad's guitar, I think he, uh, it was his, uh, either his Les Paul or his ES-335 uh, type guitar, and um, I was really into the band Everclear at the time, and I was like, you know, what would be really fun is if I learned the song Santa Monica by Everclear on guitar, so I learned it from uh, tabs on the internet. And then a couple weeks later, I was in the car with my dad and uh, we heard another song on the radio. And I was like, oh, that's the same chord from Santa Monica. And my dad kind of looked at me and he was like, oh, you, you know what notes are. And so he kind of put it all together and continued to encourage me to play guitar because he's like, you have perfect relative pitch. Like you should really explore that and figure out how you're going to use that. But again, songwriting um, didn't come to me until like kind of my late teen years, I was really shy and nervous about presenting songs to anybody. Um, I would write songs privately, but they were pretty funny. Like I tried to write a song like Achilles Last Stand by Led Zeppelin and it was like 10 minutes long and <laughs> nobody wanted to hear it. <laughs> that probably still exists somewhere, hopefully. Oh yeah, 100% exists somewhere, yeah. Uh, we, do we documented everything. Our dad taught us how to uh, record on our tape machines. We had like little boom boxes. He taught us how to use them to overdub. So my sister and I were making up uh, sometimes songs about how much we loved our parents, uh, sometimes songs about Mars, uh, you know, whatever. They were all like little mini prog epics. <laughs> yeah, essentially, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you're in your teens, you're playing guitar, but you're also playing drums. Obviously, you get extremely good at drums. Where does Dr. Dog start to fit into the picture? So right around the time that my job with not only Adrian Ballou, but I was also playing in a Frank Zappa touring band called Project Object. So um, I don't want to interrupt you, dude, but I just want to make sure that everyone here is clear. You cannot be playing with Adrian Ballou, and you can definitely not be playing in a Frank Zappa cover band if you are not badass. So what, well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting because like that music has its own language. And once you get into the rhythm of that language, it actually does become easier in a way. I know that sounds like a little insane to say, but there are certain patterns that happen throughout that music that like become part of the language of it. And it got to about 2009, 2010, where that stuff was starting to sort of fade into the background for me. And I took a real interest in songwriting. And um, I started my band Lithuania with my, my friend Dominic that you saw at the Rickshaw stop. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then simultaneous to that, I joined Dr. Dog, which was one of my favorite bands around town in Philadelphia. They were not the Dr. Dog that they are today, um, but around Philly, they were like the cool band that everyone loved and very, you know, Beatles-esque. Uh, so I, I became friends with them and then they asked me to join and I learned a whole new wealth of knowledge about not, not only how to play drums for the song, but also like how to write songs and uh, song craft, you know? And so Lithuania was going on at that same time. You were playing bass and also writing songs in Lithuania with Dom, correct? Well, when we first started Lithuania, it was just drums and guitar because we were trying to do like our Black Keys thing, you know? Uh, this was around that time, like 2009, 2010, there was Japan yep. Droids, Black Keys. So we were trying to do our duo thing. And we actually did a tour right after I joined Dr. Dog and uh, it was a blast, but you know, I, I, Dr. Dog started to ramp up the schedule and then Dominic from Lithuania started playing as a sideman in a lot of other bands. So we took a little bit of a diversion for a couple of years and then we kind of reconnected in 2014 to make our first record. How do you, I, I've been struggling all week trying to figure out a way to ask you this question, but I guess the, the best way is bluntly, 
how do you fit it all into your head? It goes into so many different directions. Lithuania is one thing. Dr. Dog is one thing. Obviously, Adrian Ballou and Frank Zappa are on a whole different tip besides that. How does it all compute together for you? Wow. I mean, it's like in, sometimes it's in one ear at the other. I mean, it's like uh, I try to manage all of it by understanding that like each one has its own compartment. And that was something that I had picked up from Mike Watt from the Minutemen. Like not I don't know him personally, but I just always respected that if he had an idea for a band, he would just start a new project. Same thing with like Nels Klein from Wilco. Like he if he wanted to do a free jazz project, he wouldn't call it Nels Klein. He'd call it like something else. So I have all these desires musically, but they don't necessarily all fit with under, under the umbrella of my own name. So Lithuania is sort of the place where I can get like, get the let out, get the aggression out. And then like my own solo work is where I can be a little bit more empathetic and sensitive. And then Dr. Dog is where I can be a drummer and, and serve the song. And then like, I mean, who knows what will happen in the future if I join like a fusion band and, and, you know, play crazy music again. Who knows? It could happen easily, huh? I'm wearing a weather report shirt. So, I mean, <laughs> you'd be down for the 20 piece kit at any time. You know, it, it's funny. There was one Dr. Dog tour where I got to use like a, like a Roto Toms concert toms, you know, more symbols than I should have been using. And it was way too much fun. So because you are proficient in so many different instruments, tell me about your songwriting process. For your own stuff, do you write on guitar? Do you write on marimba? How do, how do you set up what you're doing and getting guitar? It always changes because I'm trying to trick myself. So like if I play guitar, you know, and I'm sure you can attest to this, like you write a song and maybe the chord shapes kind of fall into the same pattern that you always do. So sometimes I'll be like, okay, I got to step away from guitar for a minute. I'm going to write on piano. But generally speaking, the way that I work best is in short bursts. So I'll like set a timer for myself, try to write as much as I can in like 30 to 45 minutes and then put it aside. And then maybe I'll come back to the next day and be like, huh, there's some cool parts here. Maybe I could turn that into a song. There are some songs that happen immediately and fall out of you, like, like you know, bar for whatever. And then there's, <laughs> and then there's some that are like, I've been working on for six years and can't find the right chorus for the song. And so it just always has to be on the back burner. And I think a lot of people that I love and um, respect in the songwriting world, they kind of operate in the same zone where it's like, it's never just like I write my songs and I know exactly what I'm doing all the time. It's more just like, Oh man, this is a nice song. Let me see what the, maybe it's, let me see if I can get 10 songs that have like a, a concept or a through line and I can follow that through line. With something like children where you have a concept in mind, are you lyrics first and then you're fitting that to the chords that you already have written or how do you develop that? It's almost always melody first. So I consider myself to be stronger in the melody zone than in the harmony zone. So a lot of times when I'm writing a melody, I'll be walking around outside and maybe I'll have my phone on voice memo and I'll just be kind of working out like, where should the melody go? And you know, does it need to go up? Does it need to go down? And I'm still, learning that you know it, it's not like i had a wealth of knowledge when i was in my early teens about songwriting this is all still i'm still learning and so you know uh my wife natalie is a singer songwriter and she's told me a lot about like you know you're gonna have to figure out where your voice sits and you're gonna have to figure out like what songs you want to present to people all this stuff is like very important as a songwriter and as an artist to to be intentional after you've written you know, it's I also want to mention as a brief aside that voice memos has to get like a gold medal from musicians everywhere. Believe me, it is like the underrated star of all songwriting. Anyone who I know who's a musician has like you look at their voice memos. It's just tons and tons and tons and tons of ideas. It's crazy that like people remembered their songs before voice memos. <laughs> you know, like we there was some point in time when like people had the capacity you know, like, you know, McCartney and Lennon were like, yeah, we remember paperback writer, like front to back without it, without like a reference tape, you know, like it's, it's mind blowing. So can we hear another one that you've written here? I would love to uh, have you introduce this song. I think it's over it, right? Oh yeah. So this song is called over it. It's the next song on the record Wiseacre. It's right after children and over it. I tried to map out the album chronologically over the you know the course of two years and over it is sort of like being self-deprecating it's like i'm asking myself how can i not get over certain things in my life why can i not let them go 
Um, my dad used to have a mug that had like a cat uh, with claw marks dragging down a wall. And uh, that's sort of the image I was going after with that. Hey, this, this one's, one's called, called Over It. it. And in the bloodlust of the evening Can't help but believe That flame in the furnace That's burning in earnest If love was all In the time that I have known you, you've gotten married. Your wife, Natalie, is also a songwriter. She's amazing. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about how your creative processes kind of yin-yang together, I guess, for lack of a better way to put it. How does she inspire you? How do you inspire her? And have you guys worked together? Tell me about that. Yeah, well, I don't know how much I inspire her, but she inspires me a lot. And I think that, um, you know, when we first got together, it was such a welcome change because she was always extremely honest with me about stuff. And um, if I was writing a song or if I was working on anything creative, she would always approach it with a very kind but critical ear. She's also been writing songs a lot longer than I've been writing songs. So she just has a much wider 
breadth of knowledge about all of it. Um, so I take what she says extremely seriously and extremely to heart. Um, and sometimes that's for better or for worse. Sometimes I was like, oh no, like my song sucks or, you know, I didn't sing it well enough or whatever. But then like, you know, when I did have my moments of, su of succeeding, she was really encouraging. Um, so the way that we've worked together is that um, I got to play drums in her band on tour for a couple of years. And that was like, I mean, what a dream that is. You know, it's like you get to share that sacred space of being on stage with somebody every night. And it was just like, we were working together. It was so fun. And then like, it was also fun because if I was ever like slowing down a song, she'd look at me and be like, give me the look. And I would, it's almost like the same kind of telepathy, right? It's like, I could sort of read the body language and be like, okay, she wants it faster. She wants it slower. Okay, I'm like playing too hard, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, but then we got to collaborate on on the record, and uh, she sang on my song "Closer to Heaven," which I wrote with Scott from Doctor Dog, and um, she knocked it out of the park, as far as everyone uh, has told me so far. Do your songs have like a Natalie test? If she's if she's down with it, then you're then you're good, pretty much. You feel? Oh, definitely. I think behind every uh, stupid idiot man is a brilliant woman. So I think uh, uh, I think that's true in our case as well. Yeah, it's probably really awesome to be able to have so much of your life is devoted to music, having a partner who is not in that world. I can see how that would even almost be more challenging. It's much nicer when someone understands what it's like to go on tour, someone understands that you have to travel and when you can do it together, it's even even better, I would say. Absolutely. And I also think that like, you know, when someone doesn't understand, it can feel so detrimental. And like, I'm, I'm such a music person. I'm so music obsessive that if I couldn't share that with somebody, I would just feel like we were, you know, at a, we were kind of at a loss. I, I also think that I'm kind of a dullard. Like I, I only know how to talk about music. So it's like, it's helpful that I can speak in those terms with her um, and not feel like I'm a complete nerd. Yep. Hey, big ups on throwing dullard in there, I have to say. Dullard. <laughs> <laughs> One of the other things I know you did in 2020 was buy a house. Congratulations, of course. I bring that up in particular because I know there was a studio in the house when you got it. So yes. tell me about that and tell me about how you're using it now. Man, the studio has been such a place, I don't want to say godsend, but like just like a place of respite where like, you know, every day I can go back there and work on stuff, work on projects for other people. The remote session work, the virtual lessons, all of that stuff has been crucial in our post home purchasing uh, financial situation. So like we signed our, uh, we, we signed on March 13th to give you some perspective. Like that's when we, we got the house literally like the day the pandemic hit. Friday the 13th, oh geez, you know, like, come on. Um, but yeah, I mean, being able to work back there has been super beneficial and uh, it's kind of like keeping me sane amidst all this because I can't tour and touring was such a huge part of how I identified with the world, mm -hmm. you know? Well, and I think this is also a good time to bring up, we have a lot of songwriters who of course are involved and follow what we're doing. It's a great time to talk about the drum sample pack. So uh, mm. just, just put some, put a plug in there for that, if you will. Yeah, I mean, my friend Jeremy Ferguson, who recorded my album Wiseacre, he hit me up a couple months ago and was like, hey, you know, something that might be really useful for all the DIY musicians out there is a sample pack of the drum sounds that we get at Battle Tapes. And so I was like, yeah, that sounds awesome. You know, and doing the sample pack can be very meticulous. You have to sit there and do like six to 10 different velocities for every drum, but... Um, and then you got to come up with loops and come up with drum beats and fill ideas that would be advantageous to people. Um, but it's been going great and people have been buying it and using it and they've been sending me the results and I'm just like, oh man, this is so fun. You know, in a way I'm like a, a virtual session musician as well. <laughs> have you been cool. shocked by any of the ways that people have used your beats? Yes, extremely. So there's one guy uh, out, I think in Nevada who, because uh, we in some of the sample packs we included all the drum stems for Wiseacre, and he's been taking like the drum the drum performances from the record and making completely new songs out of them, and that's been really cool to hear because he's taking them to almost like a weird like Aphex Twin meets Radiohead kind of zone, and that's really really cool. 
it's awesome when uh, like the best creative things happen i think when someone does something else creative and then someone else comes along and they want to build another creative idea on top of that i mean everything's already been created anyway right so everything now is just a a revision or a, or a reinterpretation of things that have gone before it and when you have that like your chocolate and my peanut butter it comes mm -hmm. up with something really cool like, well well it's true i mean it's like everything that has happened especially in the the, the post-internet world is like it's a recontextualization mm -hmm. so we're always trying to reinterpret things and make them fresh and i think that's been true i think that's kind of secretly been true since the beginning of time we're always sort of reinterpreting stuff but um it's now even more obvious that that's the way that new things get created. So it's important that we uh, learn from each other, borrow from each other, sometimes steal from each other. It actually does create good uh, artwork and valid artwork. So this just came to me now as you were saying that. What's your, I was just thinking to myself, do you, have you read Planet Drum? And I just wanted to think to myself, like what, what is your most inspirational music book? Where do you... <sighs> What do you go to when you're trying to find inspiration from from literature? Wow. Um, you know Planet Drum, right? I assume Mickey. Oh Hart. yeah. Oh yeah. I know Mickey Hart. Um, the yeah. I mean, that's really funny that you brought up Planet Drum. I haven't thought about that in so long. It just but when it <laughs> when it comes to music literature, the things I find most inspiring are actually old scores. Like uh, something that I do is I go to like this local um, used bookshop and they always have like an influx of 20th and 21st century classical scores. And I find that to be super inspiring because like a lot of the most groundbreaking harmonic stuff is still happening in that world. So I might like open up one of those books and play a cluster on piano and then I'm like, oh, wow, like that's a really interesting texture. Maybe like that's something I could use. Or um, there was also in the making of Wiseacre, I have like this old Burt Bacharach, Hal David songbook. And sometimes I would just like open a random page, play a chord. And that was really inspiring. Um, but then, you know, like I'm looking over at my book collection now. And a lot of the things that inspire me are actually like books about Buddhism and, and Zen, uh, because those are the things that I find most applicable to my, uh, not only songwriting practice, but also just like how I can sustain myself as a, a person and as a musician. Do you ever get into the more scientific and technical parts of it, like the, like Daniel Levitin or that kind of direction? Uh, definitely. I mean, I tr at least I try to ex understand it as much as possible. Um, I mean, the, the David Byrne book was really great for that. I feel like he covered a lot of topics that I had never really um, thought about as far as music, especially when it came down to like how music is supposed to be presented and how certain types of music it can only exist in certain vacuums. Like the talking heads at CBGB is much different than the talking heads doing Stop Making Sense because they had out they had sort of outgrown their just their need to play at cbgbs the material fit the room things like that have always intrigued me and i, I still find them to be uh intriguing whenever i talk to you i feel like your creativity comes from so many different directions it always makes me think of uh the brian eno i'm trying to think of his card deck i'm sure uh, you're about to tell me the name but the, I, the the oblique strategies the oblique strategies yeah that's yeah. it this makes me think of of you're going to come in with some idea and be like, let's try this one standing on our heads or whatever. Um, awesome. Well, sure. And, and I think that, but a lot of those concepts come from Zen Buddhism, right? Like a lot of his abstractions are coming from places of like, you know, ima imagine water dripping down a tree or, you know, they're, they're a little bit more synesthetic than they are, um, you know, rooted in like play a G chord. You know? right. <laughs> and and, I, and yeah. I think that's what I was kind of speaking to earlier, where it's like, I'm always trying to trick myself when I'm writing music. So it's like, if I play a G chord, there are some, some days when I play a G chord and it sounds like the most sonorous, beautiful chord in the world. And then there's some days you play it and it sounds like garbage. So it's like, it's, all, it's also your perception of things that's cha constantly changing too. But I think you really bridge the gap of those sides really well because I know you have a very broad technical understanding of music due to your experience on all sorts of different instruments, but your music itself, the Eric Slick music, always comes across to me as childlike maybe isn't doing it. It's it's fresh because it has that kind of like new mind perspective, I feel. How do you ignore all of your technical knowledge to come up with something that's new and fresh? 
Well, it's sort of like, you know, you kind of, I, I treat it like the way that like ELO is, right? Where it's like a Jeff Lynn song will have their like cowboy chords, right? Like it'll be like C, D, G, but then there'll be one chord in there where it's like a diminished or an augmented chord. And I meet my, my ear gravitates towards that push and pull. I've always liked music that does that, that has those sort of dense chords within the easy chords and so when I, I realized this when I was working on my last record I was like oh man Jeff Lynn is like the groundwork for everything that I like about music he has these really simple chords that are that are like kind of sing-songy campfire style but then he'll throw in like you know the song will be in C and then he'll throw like an A flat diminished in there and it throws the the whole gravity of the song off and I and I love those moments because it creates tension and release right like that's that's what it's all about uh -oh. yep. that makes that perfect to me man sorry we lost you here for just a second are we good yeah, okay we're back we're back oh, yeah cool. that's where we <laughs> Woo. Oh, I was like not yeah, during the live stream no well, let, let me, uh, let's pull us back to the superficial here really quickly. I've known you for a while, as I, I'm sure I've mentioned numerous times, and I'm, I'm just getting hip to the license plate thing. So t t tell me about that. You obviously have an obsession with vanity plates, and some of them are awesome. I have an obsession with vanity plates, and that stems from prior to living in Tennessee, uh, my, my wife and I lived in Richmond, Virginia. And in Virginia, it only cost, Twenty dollars to have a vanity. Of mine says "Dank You," um, uh, which is so stupid. Um, but you know, there was a complete range of incredible vanity plates in Richmond. One three x a lady, like three times a lady. Uh, uh, one just said "Boy Bop," said like. Um, mm, Mbop three, which was, and then they had a bunch of Hanson stickers all over the car. I mean, it really is a window into somebody's weird quirk. And I found that if people had a vanity plate, they were probably a pretty weird person. So it was really fascinating to take a photo with it and be like, what the, what are they, what are they thinking? You know, it's so weird. Do you ever hear back from any of the people whose license plates that you've shot over the time? Never, but I was often worried that I was going to get hit by the car as I was taking the photo. <laughs> they were going to back back up. Into Newsflash, me. drummer, songwriter, Eric Slick, destroyed by a SUV backing over his foot. Not good, not good. Yes. Well, so I know you guys have another no. companion at your house. Tell me about Marvin. Marvin is our Boston Terrier Dachshund mix. He's 10 and a half years old. He's my best friend. Uh, he is amazing and he's still kicking. He uh, recently beat uh, brain cancer and thanks to the wonderful doctors at the University of Minnesota, um, he is full of energy and as insane as ever. So he's great. Un unconditional dog love over the past few months, I'm sure has been awesome to have. Yeah, and his parents have always had dogs. We love dogs. Um, Sorry, I'm losing you here. The Wi-Fi. Am I back? Sausage is made. Am I back? You're back. You're you're. There we go. You're back. Yeah, I think it's my internet. My internet stinks. You got the studio, but you didn't get the uh, you didn't get the fiber. No. Oh, hi, Mo. Oh, no. Uh -oh. Hi. He thought he wanted to. He wanted. He wanted to join. Hi, bud. I know. I. What are you scratching me for? What happened? Okay, he's back. We're well, talking about his ears were burning. After the show, he's got to sign the model release. Thank you. So we're, we're, 
We're calling this next section two by four. Four questions, two answers to each question. And so the first one is drum. Okay. What are the two main drumstick holding grips? And do you use both? We got traditional grip and we got match grip. And yes, I do use both. When do you use traditional? I use traditional when I want to surprise myself. Do you find it much more difficult to play when you're doing traditional? Yes, but the cool thing about doing traditional is that you can do things like drags on the snare drum and you can play like really loose. Um, and that is awesome. So traditional is great for a very specific style of playing that you can't, you can't get with the match grip, Marvin. So you're from Philly, obviously, and so is Dr. Dog. What are two things about Philly that are superior to Nashville? Oh man, uh, well, the food. Okay. Uh, uh, the, the, the vegan cheesesteaks and the Szechuan food at Philadelphia uh, crush anything that is available in Nashville, I'm sorry to say. Uh, so that, and of course, uh, I'm gonna give a shout out to my dad and say Flyers hockey. Uh, Philadelphia Flyers hockey is better uh, in Philadelphia. So what are the two best things about having a partner who is also an artist? Um, mutual understanding of, the, of how uh, everything in the music industry is a lie, and also uh, being able to ag agree on essentially when something is good and when something is not good. <laughs> so tell me how everything in the industry is a lie. I think I know what you mean, but give me some clarification on that. Um, I think just that like we're kind of at a, a place with music and I, I always hope that we return to this where it's more about music than it is about everything else. Um, and I think that we've been in this sustained period of everything else mattering more than music. But at the end of the day, if you don't have a good song, then you're not going to have a career. So I think that's more what I'm talking about. That makes perfect sense to me, man. I thought you were going to say, basically, it's when we're all lip syncing. Well, <laughs> sure, lip sure. Always. Sure. always. <laughs> yeah, we're all, yeah, exactly. So final one, when we go back onto the road again, what are two essentials that you have to have for a tour that people might not expect? Well, one essential is, a, is absolutely my MIDI keyboard. Because if I can't create while I'm on tour, then I'm just staring into my phone, staring into the abyss every single day. So having something like a MIDI keyboard is always really helpful or having like access to notation software, uh, especially when I'm not trying to bother anybody else, that is crucial. Um, and honestly, having an acoustic guitar, I, I you know, having uh, a product plug, uh, Recording King acoustic guitar, those things are really helpful for me because I wake up before everybody else. So it's like eight o'clock in the morning, we're traveling through snowy Wyoming and I'm in the back lounge of our bus writing songs on an acoustic guitar. So that is what gives me the most inspiration when I'm on the road. And I think that's the most crucial thing for my own sanity. Do you have a routine for that, that you try to accomplish something every day or a certain time that you try to lock into that zone? Definitely. Like when I wake up, I like to meditate and then I like to write for a little bit. And then I usually go into the front lounge and slam down a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Love it. <laughs> DJ, it's classic, classic. Yeah. Yeah. So you, when we talked before the show, you were telling me that Wiseacre is about to get pressed to vinyl again, which is awesome. Tell me yes. about like what Dr. Dog has a new record out. You even mentioned Lithuania, which I don't know if I'm allowed to even say anything about that. Like what's coming up from Eric? Well, yeah, so there will be a repressing of Wiseacre. I can't say who with, but there will be a repressing. Um, Lithuania is putting out two new songs for Bandcamp Friday, uh, next week, February 5th. And um, Dr. Dog uh, just put out a live record today that had previously only been available for Record Store Day, but now it's available on all streaming services. So That's yeah, awesome. lots of stuff. Hey, well, you're staying busy, man. It sounds like it, which is amazing. Miraculously, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I just want you to introduce our last song here before we cut out, but I, I want to say thank you so much. You have to be one of the most creative and inspiring people that I know. It's oh. always a pleasure to hang with you. At Recording King, we really appreciate you playing our stuff. And I, normally I don't even put in that kind of plug, but just I, I'm always pumped to have a chance to talk to you, my friend. 
Well, you know, I was pretty early on the, the Lord Recording King train because I bought a guitar in Flagstaff, Arizona, and that was my main guitar for a very long period of time, and I wrote a lot of songs on it. Um, so I, I always find your instruments to be very inspiring, and uh, songs, songs just kind of happen. So um, this last song is called Pieces, and it's a, it's a Lithuania song. And the reason I chose that is because, yes, there are two new Lithuania songs coming out next week, but also you uh, came to a Lithuania show in San Francisco, and you brought us uh, guitars, and you were always so generous. So sort of my little tip of the hat to, uh, to you, Ashley. So I appreciate it. Thanks, man. Well, here we go. All right. All right. This last one's called Pieces. It's a Lithuania song. My band, Lithuania.
Thank you.